Greetings to each and every one of you. My name is Paul-André Durocher. I'm the Apostolic Administrator of Mont Laurier, the Archbishop of Gatineau. And today with you uh, on Saturday, March, uh, sorry, March, May 30th, um, it is the Saturday of the seventh week of Easter. It is the um, Eve of Pentecost, the Vigil of Pentecost today. So we're coming to the end of the Easter season, seven weeks that we've been uh, celebrating the resurrection of Christ in a special way. And we are also coming to the end of our reading of the Acts of the Apostles and of the Gospel of John. <clears throat> so let's go to Acts uh, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20, and then uh, the last two verses, 30 and 31. If you remember two days ago, we saw Paul in Jerusalem, uh, how he was sent to Caesarea. So yesterday we saw Paul in Caesarea and we saw how he appealed to the Roman emperor for judgment. And so today we see him in Rome. Since Paul had appealed to the emperor, Festus sent Paul to Rome. <clears throat> when he came into Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. So uh, it's a different situation from what we're used to. Uh, people could, depending on the situation they were in, uh, they could uh, rent a place as long as they were under supervision, under guard, uh, possibly chained to that guard. But in this situation, Paul is, has a place and people can come and see him even if he's basically under house arrest. So three days later, he called together the local leaders of the Jews who were in Rome. So this is, these are the leaders of the Roman community, Jewish community. When they had assembled, he said to them, he, he says a speech, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors, yet I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. And when they had examined me, the Romans wanted to release me because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to the emperor, even though I had no charge to bring against my nation. So what is Paul doing here? He's kind of giving an, uh, an apology or an, an explanation rather uh, for his situation, uh, claiming innocence that he's done nothing wrong, even the Roman authorities have found nothing against him. And he has nothing against the Jewish people. He says, our people, he's still Jewish, and or the customs of our ancestors. Notice, he, though, he calls them customs of our ancestors. He doesn't speak about the law anymore, you know. So, so he has nothing against those customs, but he doesn't see those customs as being necessary to be in harmony with God, to be in friendship with God. For him, it is being having faith in Jesus that is important. But at any rate, his point is that he's, nothing, he's done nothing wrong against the Jewish people, but the Jewish leaders, for a reason that he seems to say, I don't understand, won't let go of me. And so he had no choice but to appeal to the Roman emperor for justice. And this is why he's in Rome. And then he continues, uh, for this reason, therefore, I've asked to see you and speak with you, since it is for the sake of the hope of Israel that I'm bound with this chain. It's for the sake of the hope of Israel. And he's asking to meet the Jewish leaders. And what he wants to do is explain how Jesus responds to the hope of Israel, is the hope of Israel. So he wants to evangelize them. So here he is in jailed you know now it's a comfortable jail but he is bound with a chain as he says he doesn't have freedom of movement and he calls his leaders to him we skip the verses where the, the controversy typical typical story that is repeated some find it interesting others don't and so paul says well if you won't accept it then i'm going to go to the greeks i'll, I'll preach the gospel to the greeks they'll listen and, and so it's, it's kind of a recapitulation of his whole story of going first to his Jewish brothers and sisters. Some of them follow, but many don't. And in front of that refusal, then saying, well, then the gospel has to be preached to those who are not Jewish. He lived there two whole years at his own expense. He welcomed 
all who came to him. It's remarkable, two years in Rome uh, being jailed. He's just spent two years in Caesarea jail. So, and then this trip, this horrible trip that brought him across, you can read that. We can imagine that basically Paul has spent the last five years uh, chained as a prisoner. But he, he welcomes all who came to him. Uh, there's one of the old manuscripts adds uh, Jews and Greeks. It's kind of understood here, the manuscript, somebody added that to make it clear. But what does he do with them? He proclaims the kingdom of God and he teaches about the Lord Jesus. So he's doing what he's always done. Proclaiming, you know, announcing, evangelizing, and then teaching, helping people to understand it all. The two, you could say, sides of the one coin proclaiming the good news to those who know nothing of it and when they accept this good news then seeking to understand it so we would say today in the church evangelization and catechesis you know but paul was doing this so proclaiming the kingdom and teaching about the lord jesus uh, with all boldness and without hindrance proclaiming the kingdom of god and teaching about the lord jesus in rome it's uh, how can you say there's something subversive about this activity? You see, because you're at you're at the headquarters of the Roman Empire, and here you're preaching another kingdom, the kingdom of God, and the emperor reserves for himself the title of Lord, Curios in Greek. He is the Curios, the, the great Lord, but here Paul is proclaiming another Lord, Jesus the crucified one. So you can imagine here is this uh, poor, itinerant Jewish pilgrim or prophet, you could say, chained and in the heart of this powerful military kingdom, proclaiming another kingdom. In the letter to the Romans, he describes this kingdom as being a kingdom of justice, of peace and of joy. And he does it with all boldness and without hindrance. This boldness, which is his, you know, is this parresia. I've, I've uh, noted it a number of times throughout our reading of the Acts of the Apostles. This boldness is typical of the apostles who, who preach with, who teach, who evangelize with the power of the Spirit. Makes them bold. And without hindrance. Now, Paul obviously is hindered. He is hindered. But the word of God is not hindered. And I, I can't help but read this. Uh, I can't help reading this without thinking of what he writes to Timothy in his second letter to, Tim, letter to Timothy. And I invite you to read that letter if you have a chance. It's not very long, but he probably wrote it from prison, from Rome in prison. And it, it's, it's kind of his spiritual testament, Paul's testament. And he writes to Timothy, and he says to Timothy, remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David. This is my gospel. It's summed up in a few words. Jesus, the descendant of David, so the Messiah. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. But even more, he is raised from the dead, crucified and risen. The kerygma, the heart of the gospel. This is my gospel. A gospel for which, he says, I suffer hardship even to the point of being chained like a criminal. So this is his situation. He's been chained for five years. But for his sake, for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of this gospel, I suffer this. But he adds, but the word of God is not chained. And this is what's beautiful here, to see him chained, but at the same time proclaiming the gospel of Jesus with all boldness, without hindrance. And the proof that the word of God cannot be chained is that the Roman Empire has been gone for a millennia and a half. And yet the word of God is still going around the world. You cannot change it without hindrance. Some people find that this ending to the Acts of the Apostles is kind of uh, abrupt, quick. We wish that uh, Luke had written about, well, what happened to Paul? You know, did he go before the, the emperor? How did he plead? What was the judgment? What happened? 
Tradition tells us that eventually he was beheaded in Rome, but we don't know under what circumstances. He had planned on going to, uh, to Spain. He writes of that in his letter to the Romans. Maybe he, made it, maybe he was freed and he went to Spain and then he came back to Rome and died a martyr in some persecution in Rome. Who knows? For Luke, this wasn't important. For Luke, what was important was not giving a biography of Paul or of Peter for that sake. He was, he was interested in showing how the early church, under the movement and the power of the Holy Spirit, grew out from Jerusalem, through Samaria, and into Galilee, and outside even unto the ends of the world. And from Rome, you know, the gospel would spread to the whole world. This was Luke's point. But maybe another reason that he ends it so abruptly, so quickly, leaving Paul there, you know, uh, preaching the Lord Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance, maybe it's his way of saying, well, the story isn't ended. The acts are not done. Uh, they continue through those who picked up the mission of the apostles and continued going around preaching about the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the acts are being written now by you and by me. We are called to write the next chapters as we take up the ministry of the apostles and we become the witnesses of Christ. Speaking of that, let's, let's move to the gospel. Uh, we're now reading the end of John's gospel. And if you remember yesterday, we're in chapter 21, verses 20 to 25, the last five verses of the gospel. Uh, yesterday we were seeing how um, Jesus, Jesus talked to Peter and trusted him with the ministry of being the shepherd of the flock. And then... Uh, told him that he would die as a martyr and called him to follow him. So now the story goes on. After he was raised, Jesus appeared to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, indicated the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. Now, you know, who is this disciple that Jesus loved? Often in history, we've identified him with John, the writer of the gospel. But when we read the gospel, we realize it can't be the same person who's writing the gospel and who's being talked about here, at least not the following, the final version of the gospel. So we can imagine that this beloved disciple, uh, this beloved disciple wrote a lot of what we have now as the gospel of John, but there was a final writer, a final redactor who pulled it all together and set it in the shape that we have now. And he was probably a, a, a disciple of this, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Let's call him John. Let's call that disciple John. We don't know, but let's call him John. It'll be easier for what I want to say right now. And, and Peter turns and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, saw John. He was the one who had reclined next to Jesus at supper and said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? Who would ask him to ask that question? It was Peter. Peter had asked John, you asked Jesus. And, and, and John has this connection with Jesus, you know, that Peter doesn't have. Uh, when, when on Easter Sunday morning, they ran to the tomb, John and Peter together, the disciple that Jesus loved, it says, but let's call him John. So John and Peter, they run to the tomb together. And Peter goes in and he doesn't quite understand what's going on. And John, John looks in and the gospel says he saw and he believed. And then on the shores of Galilee, uh, when they're out fishing and, and Jesus is on the shore, but nobody recognizes him. And Jesus says, you know, throw out your nets, cast out your nets on the other side. And they catch this huge load of fish. Then John bends to Peter and says, it's the Lord. And that's when Peter recognized him. So, so there's a connection between John, Peter and Jesus, you know, and it's interesting in the Acts of the Apostles, in Luke's telling of it, at the beginning, John and Peter are always together. But Peter's the leader. So Peter turns to Jesus and says, Lord, what about John? What about him? And Jesus says to Peter a funny thing. If it's my will that he remain until I come, until I return in glory, what is that to you? Follow me. 
he had just said to him, follow me. In a sense, what he's saying is, don't worry about the others. Don't worry about God's plan for the others. Worry about God's plan for you. And your job is to follow me, <laughs> to, to, to take care of my sheep and to follow me even unto death on the cross. That, that's, that's your role. Don't worry about him. But the writer of the gospel, okay, the, the final writer, the redactor, he, he writes this comment, comment, this is why the rumor spread in the community that this disciple would not die. Now, this community, the community for whom this text is written, he's saying this is why in, in this community among us spread this rumor that he wouldn't die, that John wouldn't die until Jesus returned in glory. And John lived, the tradition tells us, a long time. And so they, they were convinced he wouldn't die. But then, obviously, he did. And they said, well, how can that be? Jesus said he wouldn't die. Jesus said he wouldn't die. So the author, the final author, the redactor, writes, Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. He said, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? So he kind of corrects a a misapprehension and one of the problems you see is that they thought that the beloved disciple John would be with them until Jesus returned now he's dead and we talked about this and they're being persecuted rejected you know are in the right place or not you know maybe we made a mistake and everything and so here he's saying no no you you misunderstand what Jesus wrote this is what Jesus wrote and then he adds this, the redactor. He's talking about John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He says, this is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them. Now, very interesting here. He has written them. So, so the gospel that we have today includes a lot of things that the beloved disciple wrote. So that John wrote. The final writer who's writing these final words, as I say, pulled it all together. He's saying, so he wrote them. The disciple, beloved disciple, wrote them. He is testifying to these things. That verb is in the present tense. He's not saying he testified to these things. He is testifying to them. As you're reading this, he's saying, what he wrote, as you're reading it, he's testifying to you. So in a very real sense, he's still with us. And he will be with us until Jesus returns. Because in the gospel, we have his testimony. He is testifying to us. And the writer adds, and we know that his testimony is true. Huh? Don't we? He's, he's speaking to the community. We know his testimony is true. So in a sense, he's telling the people in the community, he's still with us in these texts. Take these texts to heart. John will always be with us. And, and, and this is why for them it was so important to finish the gospel with John, because he was the founder of their community. He was their leader. Peter was the leader of the, the large church, but their community, it was John. And so he's saying, John is still with you, and he's still testifying to you. But he can't leave it with, with John, because this gospel is not about John. It's about Jesus. And so the redactor has one final little comment. This one is written first person singular. It's his own personal opinion. You know, there are also many other things that Jesus says. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. He, he ends coming back to Jesus, you know. Jesus, this we've written this about Jesus. If, if we tried to write down everything that Jesus said and did, the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. But there's another way of reading the sentence. All the books in the world would not be able to contain everything that Jesus said. And in a sense, that is very true. Because which book can contain the mystery of Christ? Indeed, books cannot. Only people can because Christ lives in those who believe in him. And so what Jesus did, what Jesus said, lives on in us. These words, they speak to us. And in believing these words, 
Jesus lives within us and we become living books. Someone once said, um, be careful of how you live. Your life might be the only Bible book some people ever read. Does it show in our lives that Christ is alive? Can they read that in the way we act, in the way we speak, in the way we choose, in the hope that is ours? Can they see that Christ is alive? This is kind of the challenge that is being set before us, before all the disciples of Christ. And, and as we read and these two readings, these two, you know, Acts and John, we're both left with kind of looking forward to the martyrdom of Peter and the martyrdom of Paul, these two great saints who ended up both being martyred in Rome. That's why in Rome we have these two beautiful basilicas over their tombs, as I was saying. Uh, they are the pillars on which our faith is founded. We say we believe in one holy Catholic apostolic church. Apostolic means founded on the apostles. And so we've seen this, you know, since we started reading these texts at Easter time. But what strikes me is how we are called now to be Peter and Paul and Barnabas and, and Timothy and Silas and Stephen and Philip. We are called to be the witnesses of the risen Lord Jesus for our world today. And isn't it good that we end with these texts on the eve of Pentecost, when tomorrow we will be reminded of how the Spirit came down upon the apostles, set their hearts on fire, and set them out to proclaim the risen Lord Jesus. Let us open our hearts to the same Spirit and take up the mission of the apostles where they left it for us. With that thought, I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.